So joining us right now is Sergeant Sarah Ash and Cyril to talk a little bit about the current situation on frontline, especially when it comes to tech. Now we have seen some reports coming out of Ukraine that saying that some of these Abram tanks supplied by the uh, United States to Ukraine are somewhat losing its effectiveness. And a few weeks ago, we even heard that some of the tanks are being pulled out. But the message is very mixed. Some are saying that they're, they are still being utilized. Some are saying that they're uh, being uh, taken out. What's the actual situation on the ground? I appreciate, again, being on TVP World, speaking partners in Poland and across the globe. So thank you for having us. Slava Ukraini. To speak about the situation on the ground, I was just in Kharkiv Oblast last week as the terror attacks by the Russian Federation continue. I toured the epicenter location where <clears throat> body fragments, parts of human beings were being pulled from the wreckage, where little kids were being brought into mobile forensic tents to test for who they belong to, their dead parents. And so while the question of partner weapons are very important, the bigger question is how can the partners come together and work with us on the front lines in Ukraine to guarantee the safety of Ukrainian civilians and to ensure that the Russian Federation is not able to carry out genocide against the Ukrainian people. Right, so a lot of talks is also about the potential of NATO troops on the ground, perhaps not directly fighting, but also doing like kind of secondary uh, duties over there in Ukraine. How will that alleviate the situation you just mentioned? I believe that we welcome any type of help from our uh, partners in the NATO coalition. And I do hope that in July, there will be some announcement surrounding Ukraine's ascension in NATO. Regarding the actual service of NATO troops in Ukraine, I'll leave that to our commanders and diplomats to announce. What I will say is that no doubt they would be welcome if and when the French government and the Ukrainian government come to some sort of an agreement on it. And other countries as well are always welcome to see what's happening in Ukraine and to join us in this fight for liberty and liberation against the Russian enemy. So now we hear that China has declined to attend this peace summit that is just around the corner uh, due to happen in Switzerland. Uh, what are your thoughts as to what might actually happen, take place, what might be agreed on uh, at this summit? President Zelensky is a statesman of historic proportions. And this is not a question of which world leaders are attending, although it's disappointing if some world leaders have uh, uh, telegraphed or announced that they wouldn't attend. Nonetheless, this is a global war against the Russian enemy, a global war against tyranny, a global war for freedom. And so uh, with President Zelensky hosting this peace summit, President Zelensky explaining the 10 points of his peace formula that have been clearly recognized by more than 50 countries now as a way forward. We do expect a significant amount of movement in regards to understanding our position, why the partners across the globe have to come together to stop their threat and ultimately use it as a springboard into the NATO summit the following month. Right, and you mentioned this being a war for freedom and against tyranny. And when we talk about tyranny, we do see that the axis of tyranny is, is kind of start, start to slowly emerge and kind of bury its fangs, especially when it comes to uh, China's open willingness to kind of support Russia and their war efforts. And a lot of our analysts and experts have been telling us is that it's probably because they have sensed blood in the water. Do you think that there's anything the NATO allies can do to alleviate the situation maybe show more will and unity to defend Ukraine in order for that not to happen? Without addressing any particular countries, I will say that a strong message has to be sent to any of those countries that are assisting Russia in carrying out genocide in Ukraine. We can speak clearly of North Korea, where we've seen North Korean missiles end up against the people of Kharkiv. We can speak against the Iranians, where we know the Shahids have hit the people of Kyiv and, and other parts of the country, especially in the south, in Odessa. We can speak of what's going on in places like Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. And if and when there is direct proof of China's involvement, I think China can then be added to that list. Until then, diplomacy has to be, uh, uh, the, the diplomatic route has to be the one that's engaged with countries that are still attempting to at least give mouth service to the idea of peace and uh, a free Ukraine. 
Well, now we hear that the U.S. Uh, and several other countries uh, have expressed that Ukraine should use these Western-sourced weapons uh, to attack legitimate sites uh, on Russian territory. How do you think that that will impact this battle against Russian aggression? That's the question of the day, and, and I'm happy to tell the audience that with permission to attack on the Russian soil using any weapons at our disposal, those produced in Ukraine or given by our partners will make a significant difference. If you see a 295 bomber coming at us, if you see a 222 bomber, and we're able to engage it before it can take off from one of the airfields, or is it leaving uh, it, its airspace, getting ready to drop a, a FAB 250 or a FAB 500 bomb, then that will send a clear message to the enemy that you can no longer just terrorize us in the skies. <clears throat> Additionally, when we see groupings in areas such as Sumy, as the president announced a few days ago, or what we saw in Kharkiv, they can't just hide behind this so-called border. It's not a free zone that they can then carry out terror from. Terrorists will be hunted down everywhere, and the Russian enemy will understand that Ukraine and its partners have the ability and capacity and willingness to strike at their evil no matter where it's originating from. And because of this, the messaging that we've been seeing lately from our partner nations have not only been encouraging, but most definitely are waking the Russians up to understand that the rules of the game will finally be enforced in a fair manner, and Ukraine will finally be able to fight back without having to have one hand tied behind its back. Colonel General Sierski is one of the great generals of modern times. Using a full array of weapons, no doubt, Colonel General Sierski and Supreme Commander-in-Chief President Zelensky will lead Ukraine back to its 1991 borders. All right, and speaking about fighting at a disadvantage, ever since the beginning of the war, we have been hearing about the lack of aerial advantage when it comes to the disproportionate war between Russia and Ukraine. Now, we also know that uh, Zelensky was able to procure 30 F-16, as well as Poland's willingness to send some of its MiG-29s to Ukraine. How much do you think that could alleviate the situation? I don't want to speculate on the game-changing nature of any one uh, piece of equipment. What I will say is that anything that can help close the skies above Ukraine will ensure a more uh, fair and balanced war effort that we're carrying out against the enemy. It will save Ukrainian lives, civilian lives, and it will make Russia think twice before trying to carry out this genocide of the Ukrainian people. And because of that, whether it's the MiG-29 from Poland, whether it's some of these F-16s or other aerial equipment that uh, may be on the way, we have to be not only appreciative, but prepared and able to engage the enemy with it. And no doubt that our command will find very unique ways in order to take full advantage of these aerial components. I wanted to ask about regular uh, Ukrainian citizens, because I've spoken to Ukrainians who have gone to incredible efforts to leave Ukraine and have no intention of returning to Ukraine. And they've told me that all they want is for the war to end and actually would like President Zelensky to negotiate the end of the war and would be quite happy for parts of Ukraine uh, to be actually given to Russia as long as the war ends and for the fighting to end and for Ukrainians to be uh, you know, for the for just for the deaths to come to an end, for the killing to end, what would you say to them? President Zelensky and command answer to the Ukrainian people, and poll after poll show that the vast majority of Ukrainians want to see a return to the country's 1991 borders. This is still upwards of 75 percent in the latest non-governmental polls that have been put out there, and for those who are saying they just want the war to end, that's simply Russian propaganda. Russia wants the war to be frozen so they can rebuild their economy, rebuild their military, and invade the rest of Europe if they had the opportunity. Make no mistake, Ukraine is the front line in a battle for freedom, liberty, and liberation, but also the front line of battle to sustain democracy for all countries. And the Polish people know very well, along with our neighbors in the Baltic, such as in Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia, that the Russians do not want peace. They only know war and imperialism. And because of that, we can't listen to these voices that are asking for the war to end. The war will end when Russia leaves Ukraine and President Zelensky's 10-point peace formula is implemented.
Okay. All right, thank you so much for your input and insight, and thank you for unco uncovering all this. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you for being with us on TVP World. That was Sergeant Sarah Ashlyn uh, Cirillo.